The Body Church is dedicated to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ through authentic worship, Bible study, and service. Located in Atlanta, we're called to create a loving and caring community for all people and work together for justice and truth in our world. Recognizing that our spiritual journeys are all different, we strive to help people discover where they fit and pursue their purpose in Christ. If you've been searching for a place where real people with real problems are searching for genuine solutions, The Body Church may very well be the perfect fit. Visit thebodychurchinc.org for service times or call us if you have any questions. of helping us to understand the importance of that revelation. We pray, God, that today's message, God, be special, that we get something out of this that we've never gotten before, Lord, that we connect with you in a special way. And we pray, God, that we will walk out of here changed. Lord, that this word would empower us and set us free to be on the level you desire of us. We give you glory and we give you honor for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say... Amen. All right, we're going to talk about Jesus. We want to talk about Jesus. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. It's all about Jesus right now. And I'm very excited about that. Hope you guys had a good week. We had an excellent week. Uh, Pastor Angel and I celebrated three years of marriage last week. Hey. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, it's free. Three years. Yeah, I think I did all right with the celebration. Did I, baby? Yes, you did. She said I did all right. <laughs> good. Okay, it, was, it could be stressful. You know what I'm saying? It could be stressful. You'd be like, ah, what do I do? Yeah, there's only so much chocolate you can buy before you start getting lame, you know? So it could be stressful. But I figured out three years of gifts. So you had to, you had to keep working until you, you know what I'm saying? You, you know, you, after I started running ideas, I was like, okay, so what are we going to get next year now? I'm a year to figure that out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know what I'm saying? You're trying to be unique each year now. Chocolate's good. Chocolate's good. See, she's easy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. No complication there. All right, ladies and gentlemen. To Jesus. Who is Jesus? Good. Let us begin. Matthew 16, 13 and 19. We all know the story. Jesus comes to his disciples. Who the men say they am. They look at him and they're like, um, Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Some say you're one of the prophets. He's like, but you, who do you say I am? Peter's like, everybody fall back. I got this. You are the Christ. Son of the living God, he's like, ah, you didn't get that from your own head. Somebody told you. The Father revealed that to you. In fact, I'm feeling this right now. I'm feeling good. Father's talking to you. You know what? I'm taking the keys out of my pocket. I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. Whether you're buying it, it's born in heaven. Whether you're loosening it, it's loosening heaven. In fact, your name, Simon, forget that. Your name is Peter. You're a rock. And upon this rock, big rock, I will build my church. That little rock is a chip off the old block. I like you, Peter. I'm going to build my church on the big rock. And then next thing you know, we come to this point where Jesus asking us the same question. Because at the end of the day, he likes to know who people really think he is. He don't want just following him and not knowing who he is. Who are you really following? You say you're a Christian, who's the Christ that makes you a Christian? You say you're a Jesus follower, who is the Jesus that makes you a Jesus follower? You need to know who you're following. We don't just follow people. Some of us do, but we shouldn't. Don't be following people and you don't know who they are. That's not a good look. Even if you're following Jesus, you need to know who Jesus is too. Everybody understands that? So the question is, who do you say Jesus is? Ask your neighbor, who's Jesus? Answer the question. <laughs> say something. Say something right. Excellent. That's what I'm talking about. Good. So the point is, that's the question Jesus asks his followers then. And that's the same question he's asking you now. Who am I? Like Peter, the right answer will unlock unlimited spiritual power and authority. Everybody understands? Excellent, excellent. So our assignment, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. And he gave some to be apostles. Let's read it together. After three, two, three. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When we were thinking about how are we going to start building this church, how are we going to start building what we're going to teach, 
and we're like, you know, we just grab something. You could do that. You know, go on YouTube, see what's getting the most views. That's what we're going to teach. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you go on TBN. What's everybody saying? That's what they're going to teach. Visit a couple of churches. What's the big guy saying? That's what we're going to teach. Or you say, God, what do you want us to see? And he's like, go to the foundation. He was like, when I call the five-fold ministry gifts, these are the most basic things I give them to do. Start there. Don't do anything else beyond the foundation. Start with the foundation. And the foundation is equip the saints for the work of the ministry, edify the body of Christ until we're all unified in the faith, we all know who Jesus is, we're all perfect, and we're all on the level of Jesus Christ. And he's like, get that done first. When you're done with that, you don't know how long it's going to take you, you can move on to something else. But if you didn't do this first, what's the point? Just grabbing a message off of YouTube. Mm -hmm. He was like, start teaching the foundation. So our job is to make sure the saints are equipped, everybody's built up, everybody's unified, we all know who Jesus is, people are perfect, mature. You know what I'm saying? Kind of, when you're perfect, you're like, oh, snap, I can't be perfect, cool, mature. Mm -hmm. That's what the word really means. Until we're all on the measure of Jesus. We want to be up to that standard. He is the standard that we have in front of us. Everybody wants to be like Jesus. Everybody wants to say the kind of stuff Jesus did, said. Everybody wants to do the kind of stuff Jesus did. Jesus was never afraid. Jesus never had to pray any long, complicated prayer. He was just to the point. He raised Lazarus. He said, all right, Father, I know you hear me, but I'm just going to say this out loud so they can hear me. Lazarus, come forth. I mean, that's a very effective prayer because here comes Lazarus. And who doesn't want to be like on Jesus' level? You know, you have a very tough situation ahead of you, and God can give you a simple prayer that brings results. Because what's a powerful prayer? Not the loudest, not the most fancy, but the one that brings results. Yeah. So whatever it is to you, that's the most powerful prayer you can ever pray. Because the only thing you care about when you pray is, what's the results? Yeah. Because if my prayer sound real awesome and nothing happened, that was a wasted prayer. Yes. But he can really pray. How? How are you measuring that? Because it sound good? The results. Did something happen? Yeah. Then you're like, boy, he can pray. Because I saw the results. Because nothing else matters but the results. That's why Jesus was awesome. And we need to come up on his level. Everybody understands that? Yeah. So, the assignment of the fivefold ministry gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, continues until the entire church comes to a proper understanding of Jesus. So we're going to spend as long as we need to to make sure everybody knows who Jesus is. And when we're done with that, we can stick on to something else. But right now, we all talking about Jesus. Everybody understands? Good. So Jesus is, let's read it together. Number one, God, fully divine. Number two, man, fully human. Number three, the word. Number four, love. Number five, the truth. Number six, the consummate leader. Number seven, our perfect friend. And number eight, the ultimate sacrifice. See how close we're making it to the end? We're on seven. We're rolling. Everybody's happy? We're rolling. We're getting to know Jesus more and more each week, right? So, friendship with Jesus. Let us read John 15, 12 to 15 today. This is the foundational scripture for the friendship with Jesus sub-series. We spent a little time on the leadership. Anybody learn anything about leadership last sub-series? So now we're talking about friendship. Ain't nobody like Jesus, and ain't nobody could teach us how to live like Jesus. He nailed the friendship thing, and now it's our turn to learn about friendship by following his example. All right, let's read John 15, 12 to 15 on the screen together. After three two, three. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. So here is Jesus saying, I want to elevate the level of the relationship you and I have. You've been servants all this time and you've been good servants. But I want to invite you to the upper room. Because servants are awesome, but he's like, servants don't know what the master is doing. And he's like, I want you all to get the inside scoop on what I'm really doing. I want you all to really know what's up. He says, I call you friends. And that's his goal. I want you to be my friend. Everybody understands that? So let's dig into this. Friendship with Jesus. Let's go ahead and read through the basics of what we just learned about friendship with Jesus. Number one, let's read together. Two, three. Jesus is the best friend ever because he gave his life for his friends. Everybody gets that? We all know the cross story. It's kind of hard to go giving your life for anybody. 
unless you really love those people. And Jesus really loved us because he gave his life for us. Everybody understands? Number two, the qualification for friendship. Let's read together, my bad. Two, three. The qualification for friendship with Jesus is doing whatever he commands. He says, you know what? You're my friend because you do whatever I tell you. Everybody understands? And that's the secret. And then number three, the benefit of being a friend of Jesus is that he only tells his friends what he's doing. So Jesus is saying, the reason why I want you to be friends is because if you become my friend, I give you the heads up on whatever I'm doing. Everybody understand that? And there's something special about getting the heads up. Cool? So we're going to dig into this some more. So why be God's friend? Last week, we talked about number one. God reveals secrets and speaks clearly to his friends. Anybody learn anything about that last week? When God has a friend, he likes to talk to his friends. He likes to whisper in his friends' ears and be like, yo, this is what I'm trying to do here. And sometimes he actually goes, so what do you think? Which is very intense. When the living God comes to you and says, so what do you think? I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to bomb this place. What, what are you thinking? And they're like, um, Abraham's like, well, if you find one righteous person, would you not do it? And he's like, hmm, it's good. It's a good, 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 good thought, good thought. Um, hmm, let me think about that. That's God. What kind of relationship is that when God could come to you and be like, so, um, here's what I'm trying to do here, and tell you before everybody else finds out. I once read, no, I once heard a, a very in, impressive speaker say, the man who knows the future owns the future. The man who knows the future owns the future. And then he says, and when it actually happens, everybody else has to pay him a premium for it. Because if you know what's coming, you could do things and set yourself up in preparation for something that nobody else knows. And then when it comes, everybody's at your mercy because you're the one who was ready. Right. Joseph knew a famine was coming. So he told um, Pharaoh, for seven years, it's going to be plenty, stack up. Now, of course, for seven years, everybody was partying. Everybody else was like, oh, snap, oh, abundance. But he knew the future. He's like, after these seven years that are plenty of us, they're going to be seven lean years. And what did they do? They put away grain until they couldn't count it. All of a sudden, the seven years of lean, leanness came. Everybody had to come to them for grain. And what's the first thing they did? They said, well, um, you're going to have to pay us a premium until they run out of money. Then he's like, well, no more money. Because we're good, we don't want you to starve. How about you bring all of your capital? Your cattle and all the things that you own. Bring the cattle. And they come with the cattle and until they run the cattle. Because remember, it's seven years. Like, well, see, so you all don't have no money, you all have no cattle. All right, just sign over your properties. Sign over your properties. And then, then, I mean, we don't want you to die. We're looking out for you. So, I mean, help us help you. So they came and gave them all the properties and they gave them green. It's like, what, you have no properties? Wow. It's like, it looks like you're going to starve. Well, you know what? You'll be our slaves and then we'll give you food. At least you get to live, right? In other words, the man who knows the future owns the future. Yeah. And whoever finds out when it actually happens has to pay him a premium. Which is why if God is giving you a heads up yeah. on what's going on, you have a big advantage. You have a competitive advantage because you know what's coming. Everybody understands? But let's talk about the next level. Somebody say next level. Next level. It's one thing for God to be talking to you. It's the next thing for God to be listening to what you have to say. Number two, God listens to his friends. Let's get into this. We're going to deal with two friends of God, and we're going to see how God listened to what these guys had to say. First, we're going to talk about Abraham. We talked about him last week, and we're going to use his example again. We're going to go for it with James 2.23 on the screen. Let's read James 2, 23 together. After three, two, three. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So, it's very clear. Abraham and God were friends. Everybody understands that? The Bible's very clear. God had a couple of friends. Abraham was one of them. Intense. 
friend with God. That's next level. A lot of us, we know, servant of God. But friend is next level. So God was like, that's my homie right there. Abraham, what's up? That's my boy. Let's do this. So God listens to his friends. We have a little story here in Genesis 18, 16 to 33. I'm going to read the whole thing to set this up. God listened to his friend Abraham. Genesis 18, 16 to 33. When you're there, say amen. So we're going to start from verse 16 all the way to the end. Amen. Awesome. Any more amens? Anybody there? Genesis 18, 16. When you're there, say amen. amen. Anybody in the back of the Bible has been skipping church? It's right around Revelation. I knew it was no. Genesis is in the front. Genesis 18, 16 to 33. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Now, let me set this up. Three men show up to talk to Abraham and Sarah. And one of the men is the living God. And the others are angels. And they all look like regular guys. Cool? So when it says, and the Lord said, he's one of the men who was just standing up talking to Abraham. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. So here is Abraham, and God comes to him and says, I heard Sodom and Gomorrah are giving trouble. I heard the sin in there is real bad. I'm going to check this out. Because if I check it out, and it is what I hear it is, it's going to be bad for them. If it's not, then cool, I know. And let me go check them out. So they turn around, ready to walk. That's verse 22. But Abraham stayed back. No, the Lord stayed back. The other guys left. The other guys were actually angels. In other words, angels were like, we got this. Let's go take care of Solomon Gomorrah. And God stays there. Verse 22. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. So here's God stand before Abraham, like a, like a friend. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? This is Abraham talking to God. He's like, God, you're going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? You will never do something like that. Far be it from you. You wouldn't do that. Not if there's 50 righteous in there. And God's like, in verse 26, So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Not I'll just spare them. I'll spare the whole place. So here is God getting into a negotiation with his friend. He's like, all right, look, I'm about to go check these people out because I hear they're real wicked. Let me see for myself. And I was like, oh, ho, 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 God, whoa. We got hasty here. What if there's some righteous people in there? You're not going to destroy the righteous and the wicked. I mean, that's, I, know, I know you enough to know you wouldn't do that. And God's kind of looking at him like, okay, sorry. If you see 50 righteous in there, would you spare them? And God's like, yeah, yeah. I can do 50. Abraham thinks, cool. Then he thought to himself, 
What if there's not 50? Verse 27. <laughs> then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I who am the dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? So he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. So Abraham's like, okay, cool. Um, maybe 50 is a bit much. Uh, if a family of five go back to sin, and we have 45 righteous, you destroy them? God was like, no, I'll do it for 45. Then he thought, 45 might be ambitious. <laughs> Verse 29, and he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose... There should be 40 from there. So he said, okay, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Then he thought, perhaps there's not 40. <laughs> All right, here's the deal. Um, then he said, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak. Okay, suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, <clears throat> and he said, indeed, not <coughs> I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20. Should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Uh, woo! Then he said, we're on a roll. Let not the law be angry. And I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Uh, woo -hoo! So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. Now I want you to look at that whole negotiation. Okay, I I'll give you 30 for that right there. I was like, I'll do 30, but what about 25? But what about 20? What about 10? And it's a one-sided negotiation. God is reasoning with him, and God is not giving him anything. God is basically saying, you know what, Abraham, because of the level of our relationship, I will discuss this with you. And God was willing to change his plans based on what Abraham was saying to him. Now think about that level of relationship and think, what would it be like if God has already made a decision concerning something, brings it to me, and then he's willing to listen to my reasoning? Who doesn't want a relationship to get to that level? Where God's already made his mind up. And he's like, well... So what do you think about if I, you know, go ahead and, you know, destroy that city? And you're like, whoa, what's with the destruction? Uh, I mean, could you, like, give them a chance? And God's like, okay. God. You see, and this is the thing about God. He's the same God who somebody else will come and be like, so God, how about you spare the city? He's like, would you get out of my way before I destroy you too? And think, this is the same God. No respect of persons. Scripture also says, I am God, I do not change. So here is God saying, I don't change. If I say something, it is. But I make special considerations for my friends. So here is God who's supposed to be equal to everybody, he loves everybody the same way. But if you become his friend, you can start negotiating. Think about that. That's next level. And my thing is, obviously, everybody doesn't understand that. So as a result, there's no sense in attaining to something you don't really understand or even are aware of. But when you become aware that there is another level in your relationship with the living God where you can begin to talk to God and say, God, I know you said this. I'm just thinking. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not telling you what to do. I mean, you are God. But I'm just thinking. Perhaps, how about if you consider this other position. And God says, hmm, cool. I know you'll faint, right? No, he did not say cool. God just listened to me. Because that's how Abraham was feeling. Because Abraham was like, look, God, I'm not, I ain't trying to cause no trouble. But I'm just saying. Um, 40? 35? Somebody give me 20, somebody give me 20, 20, give me 10, give me 10, give me 10, give me 10, I'm just sold! The sad thing is he gets there and they won't even 10. But, that's, a, that, that's another issue. That is, that is his fault. I mean, he, he worked hard to save them lives. And they couldn't find 10. Like, Lot, really? Anyway. So when God told Abraham his plans for destroying Solomon and Gomorrah, Abraham responded with intercession. 
See, that's what intercession really is. Where God shows you something's coming and you jump in front like, whoa, ho, 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 ho. no, 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 no. Let's not be doing that. And then God listens. Because he doesn't have to. Which is why if you don't intercede, he will do whatever he's going to do. It is finished. And God's like, I am showing you something. Why? So you can do something about it. Because if I don't tell you, you will never know. It's just going to happen. Everybody understands that? You see, God was willing to reason with Abraham because of their friendship. Hence, a master key to effective intercession is a close relationship with God. Anyone who's going to be a good intercessor has to be someone who is so close to God that God actually will listen to you. Because sometimes we get into the tools of intercession and we get into all these deep things and not realize, step number one, will he even listen to what you have to say? Because we start talking about how to say it and what to say before getting past point one, which is, will he even listen? So the step number one is, you got to know he's going to actually listen to you before you open your mouth and start talking and wasting your time and his. Because if he's not going to listen to you, no sense talking. And he's like, when you and I have a really close relationship, I will give you a heads up on stuff that's coming. Because Abraham was not in Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham was not saving his own life. So God wasn't telling Abraham about, I'm going to destroy you. He was interceding on behalf of somebody else. So God comes and tells him, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, which is where your nephew Lot lives and his entire family. And I'm just saying, I'm going to destroy it. And God checked himself and said, am I going to not tell my friend Abraham what I'm about to do? Let's think about that. Here is God saying, am I going to hide this from Abraham? I know he's going to teach his children all the right things. Uh, all right, Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. And my thing is, here is God teaching us. Friendship with me is possible. And here's why you want it. Because I'm going to give you heads ups. One, and then two, your response to the heads up is intercession. Intercede. Get in the way of what you're seeing if what you're seeing is not what you want to see. Because if God lets you see it, he's willing to hear what you have to say concerning it. And that's what he did with Abraham. I tell you, I'm going to destroy them. And he's like, destroy who? God, please, don't do this. And God's like, all right, for 10. And it wasn't 10. But that's Abraham's problem. He's <laughs> like, bro, I mean, he tried his best. But I went from 50 down to 10. He really worked. So I'm like, it ain't his fault. Lot of them couldn't get 10 people to at least be righteous because everybody would have lived in that 10. But that's not Abraham's fault. And my thing is, how many of us want to get to that point where you're minding your own business and you're spending time with God. You know, you're talking to him and he's going like, am I not going to tell Sister Sandy what I'm about to do? All right, here's the deal. Here's my plan, Sandy. This is what's going to happen to your mother. It's going to happen next week. Blah, blah, blah. Cool? And you're like, whoa, what's all of this? Whoa, what's with all the finality? Here's the deal. How about if you can do this, that, this? I mean, I'm just saying, let's negotiate here. And God's like, okay. That's next level. And God's like, all right, here's the deal. Um, I've been hearing a whole lot about what's been going on at your company, and I think it's a wrap for all of y'all. Y'all about to go belly up. This business is corrupt. And y'all are done. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, God. Give me an opportunity and let me shoot off an email. Let me see if I can talk to, let me get a meeting. Let me try to negotiate. Let me try to talk to them. I'll work something out. And God's like, you sure? He's like, yeah, I, I got it. Let me, give me a shot. Give me one week. Give me one week. If it don't work, my resume is out Monday morning. But give me one week. And my thing is, that's the level of relationship that we have to get to as Christians, that we have to take responsibility for as individuals. I want to get beyond the level where things just happen to me. Mm -hmm. Where now I can know ahead of time something's going to happen, and I also have 
the ability to do something about it. I always tell you the story about my own situation, because it's, it's recent, it's fresh, where I had a dream, and God showed me what was going to happen at my office. I mean, clear as day. I wake up in the bed, I look at passage, and she's like, you know what's about to happen to me? She's like, you wouldn't be, I was like, oh, you wouldn't believe it. I'm sorry, and he said this, and he said that, and then he went to that guy's office, and he was, he was busy, he was on the phone, he was talking to somebody, and then he said this, and you wouldn't believe, he came into my office. I saw the whole thing. I saw every single person's piece, what they did, and who was where, and who was too busy to do this. And I was, I was, I was going to talk to this one for help, but he wasn't there. And I told her the whole story. And she's like, wow, so what are we going to do? We're going to get out of there <laughs> as fast as possible. And that's the God we serve. And God's like, when are my people going to desire that level of relationship with me where stuff don't just happen to you? You don't just be like, I didn't know this was coming. I was like, I could have told you. When was the last time you came and talked to me? Mm. I don't know you. It just happened. And my thing is, life happens to people who don't have a very close relationship with God. Mm. Stuff just happens. Mm. Like, you always get blindsided. Stuff just happens. You'd be walking around like, oh my goodness, I can't believe. And God's like, I could have told you. Mm. Because many times, God has given us heads up on stuff and we just say, listen, I don't care. I'm, 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 that's, what, that's what I want. And it happens, and after a while, your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit goes lower and lower and lower and lower to the point where you can't hear anything he's saying, and then you just be walking into stuff. And situations just be happening to you. And you're always shocked. And God's like, man, if you and I get our friendship together, and remember we explained what the friendship is. The friendship with God comes as a result of doing what he says. God's like, if I get some people who will do what I tell them, we can get really close. We get really close, I start telling you where everything that's good is. Elijah and God were friends. So God was like, all right, Elijah, here's the deal. I'm about to make a famine. I'm going to send you to a brook, the only brook that has some water. I'm going to give you a heads up. And then the water starts right now. He's like, good, I'm going to send you to a widow. She's going to save your life. And this is God just talking to him. It's cool like that. And God's like, things happen in this earth, and things are coming in this earth, and everybody is going to be shocked except for those who have a friendship with God. They're always going to know when stuff's going to happen, and they're always going to know when not to be certain places. Like, man, I just didn't feel like going to work today. Well, good thing you didn't go, because those towers went down. And who wouldn't want to be that person you woke up that morning, you're getting ready to go to work, and God's like, go work where? You ain't going nowhere. Stay home. Stay home? Man, I got so much reports to do. You know, God's like, if you, if, mm, you ain't going to do no reports. If you go to work this morning mm. and you don't want that kind of relationship because you don't want to be shocked. My thing is nobody wants to be blindsided by life when you have a God who can tell you ahead of time, yeah. depending on your relationship. Yeah. And this is the thing about intercession. A lot of people, when they teach intercession, you know, they teach you all the deep spiritual aspects, which is good. They teach you the mechanics of it, which is good. They teach you about it, which is good. But the most fundamental aspect of it is, will he even listen to you? Because even if you have the perfect prayer, even if you do it all, if you pray all night, if you pray five hours, if you pray the scripture, you do whatever, will he even listen? And my thing is, we got to get to the, God will listen to me first. Because if he will listen, you can pray the simplest prayer and you will get an answer. Everybody understands? Yes. So let us continue. After God listens to his friends, let's talk about... God's friend Moses, Exodus 33, 11. So we talk about Abraham. Here was Abraham able to negotiate with God and say, God, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think I agree with you destroying the righteous and the wicked together. And God's like, yeah, that's true. Good point. Exodus 33, 11. God's friend Moses. Let's read Exodus 33, 11 together after three, two, three. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So here is God speaking to Moses like he speaks to a friend. The Bible's very clear. It's like God did not speak to Moses like he spoke to anybody else. And that's so next level. Because these guys are encountering God on the level that Adam encountered God. Where you read in the Old Testament, God came walking in the cool of the day in the garden after they had sinned, being like, Adam, where are you? That's next level. He said, hey, Adam, what's going on? Where you at? 
which means God is accustomed to coming down and just talking to Adam and hanging with him and walking in the cool of the day, going for a walk with God. That's, that's deep. <laughs> it's deep. And what we won't see is later many people encountered God on that level. It's available for everybody. Because here is Moses talking to God face to face. When I say face to face, that's next level. That's like God just showing up. So, how's your day, Moses? He's like, man, these children of Israel, <laughs> you would not believe what they did today. God's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like, you know what? And he goes like, you know, I think I'm going to destroy them. No, whoa, whoa, whoa. what's with the mass destruction? It's like, every time I see something, you're ready to destroy them. What's with the, everything's good. What's with the mass destruction? Come on. I ain't going to have nobody to lead. Because I mean, every time, I mean, you, God would just be like, let me wipe, let me wipe out a thousand quick. Psh, disease. <laughs> and you're like, ho, 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 ho. Because he's like, he's like, what? He's like, they're giving you trouble. I got this. There's a thousand. Pop, 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 bodies everywhere. Just clean them up, pull them out, pull them out. Yeah. It's like, now, I need you guys to listen to Moses. Anybody have a problem? No. Everybody's like, no, I'm cool, I'm cool. <laughs> That's what I thought. Proceed, Moses. <laughs> yeah, um, so as God was saying, these are the Ten Commandments. I need you guys to, um, <laughs> um, wow. Intense, intense. Yeah, thou shalt not steal. Anybody was, anybody was to steal anything? Now nah, we're good. Good. <laughs> Don't cover it. Anybody cover? Nah, I'm not going to cover it anymore. That's what, that, that's, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yes, take the bodies that way. That, don't. Not that way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> adultery, anybody? Everybody's cool? All right. I just want to. Ten. Just ten. Just do the ten. Okay? Because he's, he's kind of. He gets rough sometimes. Just ten. Just, just do the ten. I can't stop him. I'm, you see, I tried. I can't stop him. Not all the time. Not all the time. That's a relationship. That's a relationship. That's what you want. I'm talking about people mess with you and God's like, no, he didn't. And God, whoa, whoa, what's with the killing and stuff? He's like, well, at least let me slap him. All right, slap him. Say, <laughs> like, man, where that bruise come from? I try to stop him. I try to stop him. Like, that was my plan. I tried to stop him. I'm just saying, don't mess with me. That's the kind of stuff God does. And people sometimes don't realize God is very intense. He's loving, but he's, his love for you is demonstrated by some intensity against whoever is opposing you. And he listens to people. And that's what I'm talking about. He wants to develop a friendship with you so that when you talk, he listens. Who wants God to listen when you talk? Raise your hand. Because we be wasting real time spending five hours praying and no answers. Because if I'm not going to get no answer, I could be watching TV. <laughs> no, let's just be honest. Like, why am I doing No sense doing stuff that gets no response. Because all you get is a partner that, man, she can pray. So, any results? But we don't pray for results, we just pray for praying. Okay. <laughs> you go for it. See what's on TV here. Don't waste your time. Because in the end, if God's not going to listen to you, what are you saying to him then? Everybody understands? Let's talk about Moses, God's friend. So we talked about Abraham. We saw Abraham was able to negotiate. I mean, like a car salesman. Yo, I'll give you 10. A lot. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I man, I just, I got kids too. I got kids too. I got, I'm trying to. It's like nine. I mean, that's and he's he's with God negotiating on that level. You know what I'm saying? Let's talk about Moses now. The next guy who was able to talk to God. God listens to friends. We are on Numbers 11, 10 to 30. Numbers 11, 10 to 30. God listens to friends. And today's message is, you know, it's, it's really simple, but I believe God is challenging us to get to the level in our lives where when we pray, it doesn't have to be long, 
It doesn't have to be fancy, but it has to be effective. We want answers. Everybody understands that? Numbers 11, 10 to 30. Remember, he listens to his friends, and who are his friends? The ones who do what he says. So the thing is, you can't be not doing what he says and then be coming to him thinking he's going to listen to you. Numbers 11, 10 to 30. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses was also displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Listen to Moses talking to God. Eh? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them? That you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. So that is Moses talking to God. That's next level. Now the first thing you'll think is, and a lightning bolt came out and he was dead. Because <laughs> you don't, you do not. Be up, and, up in God's face like, I didn't have these children. They ain't my children. They're the children of Israel. They ain't children of Moses. Like, I got to carry them. You see how they're acting? Why am I doing this? Like, I'm, he, that's what comes to God. I'm by myself carrying all of these people. I don't want to carry them. Where am I going to find meat for them? They're crying, give us meat, give us meat. <laughs> Where am I supposed to find meat? This, he's talking to God, and God's just like, because you're thinking to yourself, you're, be, you're like, you are on the clock, Moses. You are dead. He's like, where am I going to find? You see, you're on the mouth. What did I tell you? I told you don't come into my presence. I can the fool. Did I not tell you that? Pow, did I not tell you that? <laughs> Moses, now, now your mouth is open. Good, but you have to say, God, you're awesome. Aha! Just what I thought. Because you're thinking God's going to, you think he's about to get a beat up. But, Look at the nature of their relationship. Verse 16. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take up the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. Then you shall say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, not two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. Because you have despised the Lord who is among you that have wept before him saying, why did we ever come up out of Egypt? So he started off really nice. If you, if you read this, look, look at this. like, Moses, get some, uh, get some guys to help you. Get seven, 70 guys. I'm going to anoint them. It's like, these guys are going to help you. You're not going to have to carry the burden alone. Now, let's talk about these people. Tell the people, consecrate themselves. I'm going to give them meat. And everybody's like, wow, yes. He's like, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give them meat one day. I'm not going to give you me two days, not five days, not ten, not twenty, but for a whole month. Until the meat's coming out of your nose. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he, did he not say that? Yes. Comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you until you hate meat. <laughs> because you have despised the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, Why did he ever come, why did he ever come out of Egypt? Let's think about God. Like he, he was building up. You know, he was cool first. He's like, I'm cool, I'm cool. Moses is like, Moses is like, I can't believe these people. You have, I mean, you have me carrying them on my shoulder. They want me. Where can I get me? Where can I, I can't, you caught me doing it. You could have killed me. Instead of let me deal with these such and suches. And God's like, Moses, I'm gonna get you 70 people to help you. Pick out 70 guys, I'll anoint them. Now concern the meat thing. Tell them, come on, tomorrow, 
Everybody, everybody get dressed. Everybody have a bath. They're going to get paid. And he's like, yeah! Not one day of meat. Oh, that's cool. Not two days of meat. That's cool. All right. Not three days of meat. Cool. Not um, <clears throat> a week. Cool. But a month of meat till it comes out your nose and you hate meat. <laughs> you despise me talking about I want to go back to Egypt. <laughs> now, here is God feeling Moses. Moses, I got this. I'm going to get you 70 guys to help you. But concerning them and this one meat thing, I'm going to shove meat up their nose. You want meat? I'm going to give you smell it. Smell meat. Smell it. Smell it. You want meat? That's right. Talk about I want meat. Disrespecting Moses, disrespecting me. Sniff meat. That's God. That's the Bible. That's what he said. He said, nostrils. It will be coming out. <laughs> oh, God. They're like, you would have wished you were vegetarians when you were done with this. You ain't going to ever want meat for the rest of your life. You're going to be like, go on, give us back the manna. The manna was awesome. I want more manna. <laughs> I mean, that's a conversation, huh? Anyway, where, where, where are we in the scripture? Are uh, we named done? And Moses said, the people whom I have among, who I am among, are 600,000 men on foot. Yet you have said, I will give them meat that they may eat for a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them? to provide enough for them, or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to provide enough for them? And the Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took up the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened. When the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. That's pretty intense. They never prophesied after that. I never read that. Although they never did so again. Wow. Okay. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed. But who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Then Moses said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses returned to the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Let's keep going, because it's about to get hot. I don't want you all to miss this. Now a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and left them fluttering near the camp, about a day's journey on this side, and about a day's journey on the other side. In other words, it'll take you a day to walk to see how far, that's how much quail they had on the ground. I mean, it sounds miles and miles and miles of quail. And about two cubits above the surface of the ground, what did it mean by two cubits? Three feet high of quail. Let's keep going. And the people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day and gathered the quail. He who gathered the least gathered ten homers. What's that? The one who gathered the least? <laughs> Fifty bushels. Which is like baskets or something. Right. Bushels are like big baskets. Yeah. That's a lot of quail. Anyway. <laughs> Let's keep reading this thing. It's about to get intense. And the people stayed up all that day, blah, blah, blah. Verse 33. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of the law was aroused against the people. And the Lord struck the people with a great plague. So he called the name of that place. Kibroth, 
Hatava because there they buried the people who had yielded to craving. And Kibrot Hatava, the people moved from Pil Pil Kibrot Hatava, the people moved to Hazaroth and camped at Hazaroth. So this is the end of the story. They said, we want meat, we want meat. And God was like, I'm going to give you meat until you come out your nose. Three feet high of quail for a day's journey in each direction. So how far you can walk for a day, that's how much quail was on the ground, three feet high. And they started eating like, yes, yes. They are bushel. And the scripture says, while the meat was still in their mouth, they were like, mmm. God was like, tasting good? Sickness. And all of a sudden, a plague hit them. And people started dropping the, Dick! It's like, you want me to eat it? How is it? Tasting good, tasting good. Down my child, down my child. You're down my child. They just fall on the ground. Pop, pop, fall, 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 fall. You want meat? You want meat? Who want meat? Who else? It's like, yes, yes, tastes good. Take all these bodies out of here. That's the end of the story. They cross Moses. Moses goes to God and like, I can't, these people in there, meat, they want meat. God's like, yeah, I got, I got this. I got meat. I got meat. He's blue quailing. And everybody's like, yes! As it's in their mouth, between their teeth. It's like, that's right. I can't hear you choking. Huh? Die. When Moses got tired of dealing with the children of Israel by himself, he boldly made his feelings known to God. God listened to Moses and responded by anointing 70 men to help out. Why was God willing to listen to Moses when he didn't have to? He considered Moses a friend. Moses was like, God, I can't do this. Look how much people here are. I can't carry them by myself. God's like, all right, cool. I'll give you 70 friends. That's deep. You ever went to God tired? Like, God, I can't do this. I'm tired. Just by myself. I'm trying to do this thing. I'm, I can't do everything. God's like, all right, here's 70. In a second. He answered your prayer. And these people annoying you? Observe. Because he was like, God, okay, where are you going to get meat? Like, you're going to kill, like, you know, all the fish in the sea. And God's like, no, I got this. Is my hand short? Like, am I incapable of doing what I told you? Step back and watch me do this. Three feet of kale. Three feet. I, I was going to say kale. No. Quail. <laughs> if it was kale, they wouldn't be sick. Three feet of quail. <laughs> it's a kale that I've been healthy. Like, yeah. He's like, no, no, no. Three feet of quail. This ain't no kale. Look, that'd be a dream for everyone. Like, kale, yeah. No, he's like, no, no, no. No, no, no. You want meat? I got you with this meat. I, just, I mean, it's just the sight of a day's journey of quail three feet high makes you not want to eat it. Yes. There's something about that sight. It's just like, uh, I'm good, you guys. Because obviously the people who didn't eat it were alive because they kept walking. Somebody was like, I don't want that. Golly, I'm good with the manna. Golly, just pick up this. I mean, you just go in and just a heap of quail and throw it in your basket. Some about that, don't know. This is three feet of quail. Three feet. Ah. <laughs> and everybody's like, yes, right, body kill quail. Mm, die. You know what I'm saying? Well, but the, the point of the whole thing is when you and God get to the point where you have a friendship, suddenly your relationship with God becomes authentic. Because most of us don't have that. Our relationship with God is so religious and so, ah, what's the word, boy? So form and contrived. And you can tell when somebody does not have a relationship with God by the way they talk to him. You ask somebody to pray and when they begin to pray, like you don't have a relationship with God because you don't talk to a friend the way you talk. You talk to him like he's just a master, which is cool. But there's a level beyond it. Because when you're dealing with your friend, you can be real. You don't, you don't be real with your master. Like, I wouldn't be real with my boss. I would not be real with my boss. For what? It's like, yeah, we, ain't, we ain't cool like that. I ain't going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you something. It will be as much as you need to know. But I'm going to keep it real. Because you, you and I don't have that kind of relationship. So how are you doing today? I'm cool. And I can have the... The world falling apart in my life. But I ain't telling you. I, who's you? We ain't got no relationship. In the same way, you wouldn't talk to God really if you don't know him. So the result, your Christianity stays so formal 
and you stay at that level where you're so far from him that you have to talk to him like he's off in the distance somewhere. When you, just, when you hear somebody say, God, who dwells that so far away in the heavens and looks down from millions and millions of miles away upon us, once you hear that, you're like, you do not know God. You read about him. Anytime you see somebody comes and they have to use a million different auspicious words, God, who sits high, looks low, who has the mind of such and such and such, I believe thee from the ends of the earth to the beginnings, and you're like, oh Lord, you do not know God. Because the moment you know God, you can be like Moses and say, God, I can't take this. You give me family to people here and I can't stand them. They are annoying me. Don't they want meat. They want meat. <laughs> Where am I going to give them meat? You cannot kill me before you ask me to do this. I can't do this. I'm tired. I had enough. That's real. When can you get to that relationship with God? Because Christianity becomes a lot easier when you can be honest. You can be like, go ahead, come. I'm stressed. Oh, God, this is too much. I can't, I can't do this. God, I can't hold on anymore. I've been holding on and I'm getting tired. I'm just saying. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying I don't believe what you're saying. It's getting hard. And I don't know if I can do this. Knowing that God is such a friend with you, he will respond. He will do something like, all right, cool, I'll send your friends. It's cool, I'll help you out. God, I can't, I can't, I can't pay these bills anymore. This is too much. I mean, I'm working, I'm working so hard, and I'm always behind, and I'm getting tired of this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what to do. And God's like, don't worry about it. I got you. That's the level of relationship you want with God, and that's what we're trying to teach. You can't just be satisfied with this formal, he's off in the distance, I'm a lowly creature, all the way down here on earth, and hopefully I'm going to throw some prayers and swing as far as I can and hopefully they'll hit. Versus, he's my friend. And I can be honest. I can say, God, I don't want to do this anymore. And God's like, I understand. Which is what Jesus was like when he was talking to the Father. He's like, God, if it's possible, um, <clears throat> if you could take this cup from me. But, all right. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Which was honesty. Here is Jesus, God in the flesh, having an honest conversation with God on the throne and saying, I can't do this. And my thing is, God wants us to get so close to him where we can finally be free and just live. Like life is no longer stressful. It's no longer, I got to keep all these million rules. It's, God, you know what? I haven't really trying. But number seven, number seven, number seven is a little hard. I'm just saying, you really asking me to do what? Yeah, that's a lot. And God's like, I understand. And he's like, all right, here's the deal. I'm going to help you. I'm going to send this person along your path who's going to be an example, who's going to show you how to do it. I'm going to give you this book. I'm going to show you this video. I'm going I'm to I'm show up. And that's the point of getting close to him. Where he can tell you. Because when God had the prophet Isaiah go to King Hezekiah and say, Hezekiah, um, he says, good up your loins because you are about to die. And Hezekiah was like, die where? And the scripture says he turned his face to the wall and he calls out to the living God. Because he had been a good king, a good guy. And God was like, ah, you're going to die. He comes to God, what? And God was like, okay, cool. I'll give you 15 years. Now, if you know the story, the 15 years were a bad choice. And God knew the future. Those, those were not a good 15 years. Because during those 15 years, he had a son called Manasseh. Not Manasseh, what kind of son? I think it's Manasseh's son's name. Who became the first wicked king after him. He also invited the um, Babylonian people into the temple, into his, um, where do kings live? Castles or whatever. His palace. And into his storehouses and stuff. And he, was, he, he took them on a tour. The kings of Babylon. So over here, we keep the gold and, you know, all the valuables over here. Over here, we keep the wheat. You know, just in case people ever get hungry, we store things over here. Over here, we keep all the, the um, things we have for the temple. The Babylonians. He takes them on a tour, a guided tour of his facilities. And, of course, they came back later to collect. You think they were just going to be like, oh, that's awesome, cool. See ya. They came back later with their armies. And they raided the place. So when God said, yo, you need to go, it was really in its best interest to say, whatever you say, Lord. 
But because God was in a relationship with him, God was willing to listen to him. And that's the flip side of it. Where if God says something, even if you don't agree, even though he's willing to listen to you, which he will, best case scenario, he knows more than you. And he probably does not need your position to help him make a good decision. Because if you get him to change his mind, you might walk in a situation that is not as good as his original intention. Because he was like, Hezekiah, you need to die right now. It's a wrap. His guy, no! God's like, okay, you get 15 years. Bad decision. 15 years were horrible. He made some bad decisions. He undid all the good things he had done before. And it took generations for Israel to recover from that bad decision. So that's the other side. Because then, because you know, people could go all in the other extreme. Well, cool, I'll tell God anything. Do anything, because anything is God says, because we cool like that. I can tell him to, no, no. He's like, well, 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 I'm still God, and I still know more than you. So, yes, I'm willing to reason, but you also have to trust that I know what I'm talking about when I say this is what I want to do. That makes sense? So, God listens to his friends. And the last thing we're going to say is, Will God hear you? Let's go to John 9.31. It's on the screen. New Living Translation. Let's read John 9.31 together on the screen. Will God hear you? After three, two, three. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. I, I, I know you've heard me say this before, but I love scriptures in the Bible that are so clear. There is nothing to confuse you. I mean, what about this is complex? I always compare it to my most simple scripture. Jesus wept. Did he weep or did he not weep? He wept. In the same way, we know that God doesn't listen to sinners. That's next level. John, the apostle, is saying it in such a matter-of-fact way. Next somebody saying, we know grass is green. We know the sky is blue. So he wasn't, he wasn't trying to teach a lesson. He was trying to just reiterate something everybody already knows. It's like, it's an assumption. We all know God as the sinners. We, all, we know that, right? But he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Now that scripture needs to be like a doggone t-shirt. God does not listen to sinners and on the back, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. And then you have at the bottom question, does God hear you? It's intense. And that's why I love the Bible. It's very direct. Because this is politically incorrect to say. So you tell me, all this time they're crying out to God and God's not listening? What does the scripture say? And that's the fun thing about the Bible. I mean, just, you just be like, this is, I did not say God doesn't listen. I'm just saying, what does John, the apostle John, say in John 9.31? Which means you could be spending a lot of time like those high priests of Jezebel, cutting themselves, saying, oh, woman, I love you. bring the fire. And they have a big altar there. Bring the fire. And they do their chants. Let me, let me fire, fire. And Elijah's just like, um, maybe your God's sleeping. Um, maybe he's taking a break. And they're like, oh, I love you. nothing happens. Why? Because <laughs> God listen to sinners. Yo, you really think you're going to move heaven to cause something to happen? Nothing. Everything's quiet. Scrick, crick. Crickets. Then Elijah's like, give me my altar. Who got water? Splash it. Probably walk backwards. God, you know what we're trying to do here? Send some fire. Whoosh! Now, kill all of them priests. That's the kind of confidence you can have when you know the relationship you have with the living God is real and the one they have is not. As a result, you know, it no matter what they say, it ain't got no power. Which is why prayer is more than just saying stuff or even saying the right stuff. It's the right people saying stuff. Because sometimes you might say stuff and it may not be right stuff. You don't know what to say. But because you are the right person, because God knows you, he hears that. So even your prayer, your lame, weak, Jesus, and that's all you know. God's like, okay, 
I just heard my daughter, and what she needs is a raise because her situation is such and such. And what she needs is tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. God already heard in that one, Jesus, he heard all these complex things that need to be taken care of. And what he needs right now, there's a demon attacking her son, blah, 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 and he's sick. And what you also need is, blah, 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 blah. And her husband's over there, and boom, he's about to get in a crash. And, to, and God's like, he heard all of that stuff because the right person said Jesus. The right person says, help. You don't know what to say now. All you can say is help. you confuse. Because you know you've been in them split second times and you don't know what. Yeah. Ah! Goes like, ha, ah, I get it. I'll take care of that. Mm -hmm. And you're like, all I said was, ha. Ah. He's like, I know what that ha ah, means. Because <laughs> that ha ah, came from one of my children who I have a close relationship with. Right. It's like when a baby cries and a mama knows the baby, you know that cry is a food cry. Mm -hmm. Or that cry is a something wrong cry. Or that cry is a, it doesn't matter, leave him, let him cry. Because he just likes to do that. And you know which cry is what? And God's like, ah, I know that cry. I know exactly what you need. And our issue is not to go through the 10 steps of what to say in prayer. Not the 10 steps of when to pray. Yeah. It's being the right person so no, no matter what you say, he hears you. Because yeah. that's what really matters. It's not the mechanics. Mm -hmm. It's whether he's going to hear you or not. Because that's all that matters. So I don't need to be skilled at praying. I need to be in a good relationship. Yes. Because when I'm in a good relationship, I just say what I feel. And I just be honest. It was Moses' prayers. And that's, if we didn't consider the conversation between God and Moses as prayers. We don't. It looks like a conversation. Abraham and God, that talk they had. Okay, um, 40. Somebody give me a 35, give me a 35, give me something. Give you 30, 30, give me 20, 20, give me 25, give me 20, give me, 20, give me 10. That didn't come across like it was prayer. But in reality, it was really prayer. But the relationship was so tight, it came across like a conversation. Yeah. Like he was just talking to God, and he was just being real. And God was talking back to him, and God was being real. And God was like, okay, I can do that. Like, ah, oh, look, we God. I don't want to come across like I'm being extreme. I know I said 30, but what do you do for 20? I was like, okay. I mean, remember the whole conversation? Everything he said, God was like, okay. Okay. <laughs> Woo! Okay, 20 is a little ambitious. What do you do for 10? Okay. And that was actually a prayer session. That's what a real prayer session looks like. It's a man or a woman talking to God and God talking back to the person, and they're both being real. Nobody's being fake. Nobody's reading from a prayer book 50 prayers that somebody else wrote. Because those are not your prayers. They're not. Even if you pray a prayer that was prayed by Jeremiah in the book of Jeremiah, that's Jeremiah's prayer. It's not yours. And for it to become yours, it needs to come from you. Which means when God and you talk, if you can't tell God something honest and direct, you don't have a relationship with him. And that is what you need to fix, not the mechanics of what you're saying. You have to fix the relationship so that you can say anything and he gets you. Because sometimes you don't know what to say. Sometimes you don't know anything. Sometimes you, do, you don't even feel like being deep. You just need him to do something, and you need to be able to just think, and he move. Just be like, and God's like, I see you. I got it. You just need to look at him. He's like, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, that's the thing. When you get to, you ever been in a with somebody where you just look at them and be like, and they're like, you just said words, and you just looked. My mom had that. She'd look at me and be like. <laughs> she just said, if you don't stop that right now, it's about to be on. And I'm like, I got you, I got you. I'm going to sit and read, I'm going to sit and read. Just go. I'm thinking about you and God having a relationship, and you just look at God like, and God's like, I got this. And my thing is, that's what we're trying to teach. We're like, listen, we're not trying to be overly spiritual and get no results and trying to teach you a sort of complicated sound, sounding spiritual things when the reality is if you and him don't have a relationship cool enough where you could not say it right and he still gets it, you're still not ready. Because you have to put yourself in a position where even if you don't say it right, even if you mix up the scriptures, come like Jesus, I don't know, I don't know what to say. Jesus slept. And he's like, I got you. Let me go ahead and take care of that sickness. Like, you're not asking about what sickness. He's like, I know, because you're just right now, you're confused, and you just confuse the scriptures, and you don't know what to say, and you're just, you're emotional. 
but I get you, because we're cool like that. That makes sense? And also, you can say things that you probably, after, like, ooh, I probably should not have said that. Because I know Moses, many times, probably after he finished talking to God, he probably was thinking, whoo, good thing he didn't strike me down there, boy. I was a little, that was too much. Wow. You know what I'm saying? But my thing is, but God, he understood Moses' heart. He's a meek man. He was just, it's just 500,000 nagging people. And you just start, you start, you start losing your mind. You see know what I'm saying? And Moses was like, I'm a, I'm a hurt somebody if they don't stop talking to me. Anyway, will God hear you? And we're going to end with this. God doesn't listen to sinners, but if you worship him and do his will, he'll hear you. This is a reminder of what Jesus said about friendship with God. The most important qualification is doing whatever he says. Let's stand on our feet. Why be God's friend? One, God reveals secrets and speaks clearly to his friends. Number two, God listens to his friends. And number three, God defends friends. So let's read the six, well, seven things about Jesus. All eight. That we know. After three, two, three. Jesus is God, fully divine. Man, fully human. The word, love, the truth, the consummate leader, our perfect friend, and the ultimate sacrifice. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for speaking to us today just for being the perfect friend, for inviting us to be friends with you so that, God, we can pray and get results. And we ask God you just guide us, guide us through this week. Give us directions as to what we need to do so we can obey your directions and benefit from this friendship. We thank you just for being faithful. And we ask for you to help us to be as faithful as you are. Say this after me. Say, Father, Father I thank you, thank you for your invitation, your invitation to be your friend. To be your friend. I, accept it. I accept it. I decide, I decide today, today that what's most important, what's most important to, me to me is my relationship, is my relationship with, you. with you. What matters, what matters to me is how close you and I really are. I don't care about looking like I'm spiritual. I don't care about sounding like I'm spiritual. What matters is that you and I are close, that you and I are friends, that our relationship is authentic, that I can hear your voice, and you can hear my voice because that is what true Christianity is all about. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And even right now, in your own little way, I want each person to talk to the Lord concerning your relationship with him. What do you want out of that relationship? Because when a relationship becomes authentic, you have your own words to say. And nobody has to give you a prayer to pray to God. Nobody has to tell you what to say to God. If it's real, you can talk to him for yourself in your own way. So everyone, take a, a minute or two and you just talk to the Lord about your relationship with him. Even so, come, but Jesus comes. Even so, come, but Jesus